this remote valley on the northern California coast, the native salmon are fighting for their survival. Careless logging after World War II stripped the steep hills of their forest cover. This upset the ecological balance that had supported the salmon for thousands of years. In the 1970s, a wave of new settlers came to the Matoll Valley. These idealistic homesteaders were shocked to find that the native salmon were nearly extinct. Instead of accepting this, they decided to take action. At first, they tried restoring the streams where the salmon spawn, but the erosion continued. They soon realized that salmon don't just live in streams, they live in watersheds. Restoration work reconnected these people with the natural world and awakened within them a sense of belonging to a particular place. Here is the story of how one community has learned to think like a watershed. If you want to see, want to feel, want to try to make any change, be far Western civilization, it was obvious to almost anyone who thought about it for two minutes that we lived in ecological systems and were supported by them completely. But we didn't live that way. When we extended our identity, we didn't extend them to the living systems of the planet, but rather to our families, our property, our uh, nations, our states, our basketball teams, whatever. You can talk about the living biosphere, but there are very few people, I think, who can actually hold all that in their mind. So there arises a need to approach the natural world in whatever context is comfortable for you. And watersheds work wonderfully that way because you can choose your, your own scale. The focus on fish was really a way to broaden interest and involvement in the community. Pretty much everybody can relate to fish. Nobody could deny that the salmon were disappearing, and everybody wanted to, something to be done about it. And there was a core of people here who were willing to take on this, uh, the, the fact that the system that they were closest to was, had, some, had some grievous wounds in it and see what they could do about it, both through direct projects and through uh, uh, living their own individual lives and with each other. I remember many times standing in a stream or standing on a slope um, and looking at it with an eye towards how we could put our hand into this inevitable course of nature and make a change for the difference and it was like um, a different kind of power you know it wasn't you know it wasn't power over nature but it was power to be part of uh, a positive the positive energy yeah. for nature it was very exciting this group of people is so dynamic and so passionate and motivated. Um, it's like such an honor for me to work with everybody here. It's really great. When I was a kid, I remember taking a pitchfork and going down on the river and fishing out one or two and in the first run of the salmon in the fall, you could always take out two or three salmon with a spear or a pitchfork because there were so many of them coming up the river those days. My daughter's father and I were commercial fishermen in the mid-70s. We probably were some of the, the last of the old-time salmon fishermen. We fished for about three or four years, and each year the salmon were harder and harder to catch, and it started getting pretty obvious that this was the end of an era. The pools with those days were 20, 30 feet deep. Nobody watched the loggers at all, and they had free access to tear up the, the country with 
large bulldozers and equipment. They just came in and logged off large sections of our country here and it caused a lot of erosions and there's no more pools over 10 foot deep now anywhere. There just isn't enough fish left in this river now to even make a good meal for me hardly. We always had a lot of rain here in the Matola and Pacific Northwest. But when that rain and, and snow melt came up on top of uh, all the tree removal, all the roads that were built, we had incredible erosion in a short period of time into the river systems. And from the salmon's point of view, uh, their ability to reproduce changed dramatically. One of the reasons that erosion is so crucial is because when silt and sediment get in the water, it fills up the pools where young salmon rear and will lay over the gravels that are the spawning gravels for salmon. So that smothers young eggs that have been laid there. People started migrating to Humboldt County back in the late 60s. It really was a migration of people out of the city by, by the thousands. You know, people were looking for quiet, beautiful places to retreat from the increasing warfare that was urban society and to raise their kids in decent places and perhaps to be part of a community. I, I remember the term second growth. People saying, well, we're kind of like second growth. We're coming here. The old timber is gone. We're coming here to grow our lives with the, with, the, with the new forest and to protect it as it comes on so these kinds of things don't happen again. The original Matoll Restoration Council meeting was at the uh, Council Madrone. I think it was the fall of 1984 under the uh, largest Madrone tree in the world and which is also rumored to have been used by indigenous peoples for somewhat the same purpose. We gathered a group of 40 or 50 people under that tree and talked about these problems for an afternoon, and that meeting led to the formation of the, of the Matoll Restoration Council. From there, there was an original small core group of people that worked on projects and uh, saw things that needed to be done and educated themselves on how to do it, and there was a lot of volunteer efforts. The Matoll Restoration Council conducted extensive research mapping, measuring, and analyzing the entire watershed. Much of the work was done on foot, hiking the canyons, following the tributaries up into the hills, swimming the river itself. Getting to know the watershed in this intimate way enhanced their sense of connection to their home. of gathering data, they found out where the most critical erosion problems were. They published their findings, and local inhabitants, as well as restoration groups around the world, have found their analysis useful. The powers of be in Sacramento had written off the Matoll as a salmon-producing stream. And the Matoll is a very remote place. It's an hour and a half from any Department of Fish and Game headquarters, an hour and a half from the highway. So when a bunch of non-professionals came at them with a proposal that they be allowed to take wild fish, their response was not so positive. It wasn't even a matter of financing it, because there was no money for this sort of work at that time. The Matoll Salmon Group was the first citizen-based organization in the state of California to use these small-scale hatch boxes for the purpose of native salmon stock enhancement. Here he comes. <laughs> oh, hold it down, Morgan. Hold it down. Atta boy. A little washing machine happening here. The female is much more rounded and pre pregnant looking. Because of the eggs? Because of the eggs. The tail is uh, a little more abraded here. That would be an indication to me that 
that she's probably a little closer to ripeness. I would say a couple, three days away on this fish. So the head a little towards me, so it's more over the bu bucket. There you go. Okay. Now for the big guy. Okay. Don't hold it underneath. Only shoot it out. Okay. That's it. It only takes a drop, is what the textbooks say. And we raise Chinook salmon here. Progeny of adults that we trap several miles downstream during the winter, spawn out, hatch the eggs here, and raise the fish up to about three inches long for spring release. Before we release the fish, we mark the fish using a right maxillary clip, which forms part of the upper jaw on the outside of the fish doesn't appear to impair the feeding or swimming of the fish and if they return as adults and we happen to catch a few or see them on the spawning grounds it can be identified. The hatch boxes seem to work okay. Thousands of baby salmon were released back into the river each spring, but for a long time, the overall salmon population continued to decline. The salmon group's efforts were like an emergency life support unit, which kept the fish alive. But the entire watershed needed to regain its health before the fish could truly flourish. Something more was needed. The salmon's natural habitat needed to be restored. It became clear early on that the steep hills needed to be reforested to prevent more soil erosion. The soil bankers, along with the salmon group, focused directly on one component of restoring the entire watershed. The soil bankers have planted more than 300,000 seedlings since 1986. Um, we put together a cooperative to do all sorts of restoration work, mostly what we've ended up uh, focusing on is, is planting trees. And we do it a little bit differently than is done on the wider industrial scale. In that case, you tend to come in after an area has been usually clear cut and then just uh, plant uh, a monoculture in straight rows, replacing what was usually a more diverse uh, forest. And it doesn't really do that much to replace the ecosystem. It just turns it into a fiber farm. The difference is that uh, we're mostly coming into areas not right after they've been logged, but maybe 20, 30, 40 years later, where the ownership has changed hands and uh, the area never really came back to the stocking that it was previous to being logged. And so we try to restore the conifer component, for the most part, to uh, these areas. Uh, mostly we plant Douglas fir around here. You know, we feel like the best idea is to replace what was there previously rather than doing a lot of ecological tinkering. We're here to help. We're here to help. We're After a while, the restoration workers found out that this work could sometimes be hard and tedious. Fortunately, some of the new settlers brought a background in theater and comedy with them to the Matoll. Cream salmon really was many, many, many years in the making, and Songs from it um, appeared on the fish trap. I'm the queen of the club, 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 queen of the river. And it was a form of, you know, entertainment on cold nights. This play, with a cast of local actors, successfully toured the Pacific Northwest in the early 90s. It was kind of a gift to people that were working really hard on these issues that didn't often get to laugh about it, that mostly it was just hard work and a lot of defeat. The beauty of Queen Salmon was that it pointed fun at everyone. No one was free of blame. If 
I didn't know better, I'd say, none of you share any responsibility for the salmon disappearing. No. Well, I guess it's not your fault. You know, I, th I think that the combination of education and entertainment really worked. And I think the audiences went away with a lot. A lot to think about, a lot to talk about, hopefully a lot to do. The Mattel Restoration Council, working with the Bureau of Land Management, recently removed three miles of an unused road in the heart of the King Range, a mountainous region containing hundreds of miles of creeks which feed into the Mattel River. The main reason for removing the King Range Road was it's a road to nowhere. It served no purpose. It caused a great many disruptions to the natural geologic processes. across. The drainage way from us. You can see an example of how the King Range Road has more or less been unraveling since it was constructed in 1965. When you construct a road in, you trigger a, a whole series of events and processes that dramatically increase the rates of erosion in a watershed. My father had an old growth redwood sawmill in Arcata, and uh, it ran for about 30 years. To, uh, <clears throat> we ran out of logs. The way we remove roads now is uh, what we learned from trial and error and trying different things. And it seems like more we learn about it, more we know it's the right thing to do if, if we want things to remain the way they have been in the past. Here's no more road. The natural hill slope has pretty much been restored. They left a little trail and they've mulched the site with the trees that had to be ripped out in order to do the work. And um, the portions that were done last year that look like this now have lots of little fir trees coming up and some other vegetation. So I really think in not too many years it's going to be hard to even tell that this was a road. An important part of the restoration work has been to preserve what was left of the old growth forests. These ancient forests provide a stable ecosystem on the steep hills, which prevent soil erosion. Their thick topsoil also acts like a sponge, which holds water from the winter rains and slowly releases it into the dry summer months. By the mid-80s, the public was beginning to understand that the forests of North America were diminished much more than they had realized. We uh, went out and, using aerial photographs and uh, field checking techniques, uh, developed this map of the original configuration of the landscape as far as how much of it was occupied by old growth forests and what it was now. What we found was that 93% of the original timbered uh, landscape was gone. Fortunately, just by identifying remaining old growth forests in existence, the Matoll Restoration Council has spurred people throughout the Matoll to take action to protect the forests in their communities. Many of these areas are now on the way to being preserved, but the watershed is still endangered. Most of the original forests of the Matoll were clear-cut in the 1950s. Now, 50 years later, a lot of the second-growth forest has matured enough to be logged again. If we were to see another spate of destructive logging on the scale that we, had, the last we had seen, um, all hope would be lost. Um, the remnants of the salmon runs that we had been hanging on to tooth and nail um, would be doubly jeopardized. The Matoll Restoration Council faced the situation head on, not by blocking all attempts at logging, but by monitoring timber harvest plans. 
by encouraging more ecologically sound logging and by working with the Institute for Sustainable Forestry. To be able to go to landowners and say, you can achieve some value from your timber. Over the long run, perhaps you will achieve even more value from your timber, but you can do it in an ecologically sound fashion. That's why what the Institute is doing is so important to them at all. Um, one of its major programs is called certification. It's an idea whose time has come. It's being touted widely all over the world. They come to us and they say, we want to be certified. We review their plan, very clearly established criteria that were developed by the entire community of forest activists, small-scale practitioners, foresters, scientists. If at the end of their harvest, and their overall forestry perceptions seem to fit into a long-range sustainable perspective, then that product can be certified and can be sold on the market as that. The model that the Institute for Sustainable Forestry has been developing is that if we have small logging operations in the forest, those can be feeding into a mill, and that mill can then supply several local woodworkers. And what comes out of that are finished products, so the money is staying here in the region, we're employing as many people as possible, doing something that they feel good about, as opposed to just sending on log trucks down to the Bay Area or to LA or to Europe. So I'm hopeful that by doing what we're doing, kind of the cutting edge of new forestry will help our society find a way to do it better, to live with the land instead of just take from the land. Working with especially the younger people is one of the rare instances where you're able to get almost instant feedback and some gratification that what you're doing is having an effect. That's one of the most enjoyable aspects of the work for me because I can see that they are the future and they can have a greater effect on their elders than a spiel I might deliver in a slideshow. Well I brought you a Valentine's present today. Fish eggs, yeah. Not just any kind of fish eggs though. Does anybody know what? Silver salmon. Silver salmon. Who told you? <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. Some of the restoration people have been doing a program to try to increase the numbers of salmon in the Matoll River because there's not that many coming back anymore. All right, you want to step up there? Okay, you got it? So you got to put the whole thing kind of underwater and then tip it up. Very good, very good. We know it's the work of more than one generation. Even if we were to succeed in all the work we've identified, it would still have to be maintained by coming generations. So as we grow older and tireder, uh, these uh, kids are the ones that are going to replace us. We've always known that the people that need to do this work are the people who live here, and these are the kids who are going to live here 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. And we want to use this work to encourage people to extend their identity beyond their families and their properties to the landscape that surrounds them. That is a profound cultural transformation. And uh, so we felt the need for that kind of material to be getting into kids' heads at as an early and at as, as, at as, as steady a rate as possible. Uh, one effect you can see right up here on the wall this was painted four years after the kids began the program of releasing fish into the streams and, you know, handling those beautiful eggs. And you'll notice that the big fish are swimming upstream, the little fish are swimming downstream. There's fishing going on, but what the other kids have in their hands is buckets full of fish. Nobody encouraged them to do this. That was just how life was four years after they started that program. So you see these things have demonstrable subtle effects, the real effects we won't see for 20 years. The restoration of the Matoll watershed has been a long, hard journey, which has really only just begun. The native salmon have survived and show signs of a comeback. Large areas of old growth forests have been preserved. The entire watershed has been mapped 
and erosion sources have been identified with efforts undertaken to stop the damaging sedimentation of the river and streams. These efforts to help the watershed heal itself have also created a wide awareness that everyone has a part to play in protecting and restoring the natural habitat. And perhaps just as important, it has taught those involved that a community that works and plays together with common goals is a more satisfying place in which to live. Change the way we think about it.